This is the single scariest graph I have ever seen of a nuclear power plant accident, more so than the vertical line of power at Chernobyl. The graph shows the power at the LaSalle County Nuclear Generating Station Unit 2 on the day of one unfortunate accident, and while it may not look like Chernobyl's power graph, the accident could have come very close to rivaling the sheer energy and forces produced in the last seconds of Chernobyl Reactor 4. Despite this, many have not heard of this accident, and those that have are unlikely to know why it happened, nor how close American scientists have suggested we came to catastrophe. Today, we will explore just that. In order to understand what happened at this reactor, we have to step away from the RBMK reactor design we're used to looking at on this channel, and instead look at the boiling water reactor used at the LaSalle site. This reactor doesn't have the channel layout or graphite moderation of the RBMK, instead utilising water as both moderator and coolant. This will become significant later in the video. In addition to this, we must mention two more things. The first is the negative Foyt coefficient. Unlike in RBMKs, because water acts as a moderator, the boiling in the core creates voids that result in less nuclear fission in the local area, instead of more. This causes the fission to decrease, more of a self-regulating effect than the RBMK's destabilizing positive void coefficient. The second is the recirculation pumps used in the boiling water reactor at La Salle, among virtually every other BWR in use today. These take water flowing down towards the reactor core and circulate it back around to the top of the vessel. The purpose of this is to change the density of the water flowing through the reactor by mixing the feed water flow and the water already circulating in the core, breaking up pockets of steam, the voids, and helping control the reactor power level by affecting the moderation of the reactor fuel. A higher recirculation will increase the reactor power that the core can achieve dramatically, compared to the natural flow of the water through the core alone, as we will see in this accident. And now, let's explore the events that unfolded at La Salle. The date is March 9th, 1988. La Salle Reactor 2 is being operated in normal conditions, running at 84% power producing 930 megawatts of electricity. The core flow rate is at 76% the rated limit, pumping in more than 10,000 kilograms of water every second. 99% of the control rods are fully extracted, and both recirculation pumps are running, keeping the power stable. Instrument maintenance department personnel were doing routine work on the reactor, inspecting equipment, and they would be responsible for causing the accident to unfold. You see, they were inspecting the Reactor Core Isolation Cooling System, or RCIC. In normal circumstances, this would automatically be initiated if the reactor water level fell 50 inches, 127 centimeters, below the established desired water level in the core, 518.16 centimeters above the fuel. The maintenance department received permission to carry out their work, and isolated the wide range level instrument, used to compare the various levels of instruments against a reference value. The next step was supposed to be opening the test and vent valves. However, the worker instead accidentally opened the isolation valves which flowed into the reference legs of not only the wide range level instrument, but all equipment that used the same reference leg. Coincidentally, the feed water level control was selected to channel B, which used the same reference leg as well. The pipe filled up, and at 5.32.33, this triggered a high reactor water level signal, causing all feed water pumps flowing into the reactor to begin reducing their output. 
This was not good, and the maintenance department scrambled to fix the situation, rapidly moving to shut the reference and variable leg isolation valves. As it turned out, their hastiness was going to make the situation worse. The pressure pulse that resulted from closing the valve led to a high pressure spike along every reference leg, which when compared to the test values, indicated the reactor in fact had a low water level. This initiated several signals, and at 5.32.49, both recirculation pumps tripped, or in other words, shut down. Other signals bled out in the control room, including a half scram signal which was quickly corrected. Meanwhile, the recirculation pumps rapidly stopped pumping water, and mixing the feed water and water that was already flowing through the core. Now relying on natural circulation, reactor power fell to 40%, with all the control rods still almost fully withdrawn, and a sudden reduction in steam flow out of the reactor. This kicks off a domino chain of consequences. The loss of pressure and temperature reduction creates a risk of water entering the turbines from the reactor, causing the extraction steam input to the feedwater preheaters to trip. In other words, the steam produced by the reactor that is used to preheat the water entering the core is no longer being supplied, causing the temperature of the water entering the core to subtly decrease, around a tenth of a degree every second. It would be very difficult to notice this change, but the reactor is now well on the way to an unstable condition, where the reactor power to coolant ratio was around a value that could make the reactor unstable. A condition that the plant designers were aware of and had informed the operators. The operators on shift knew that conditions would favour reactor instability but not that they were now approaching that threshold, where the delicate balance keeping the reactor around 40% would begin to break down, and they were now only exacerbating that situation. You see, instead of trying to stabilise the core, for example by inserting control rods, or increasing the feed water flow, the operators spent the next few minutes ascertaining that the problem was a result of the maintenance department personnel error, and not an actual manifesting accident. And then they set about trying to restart the feedwater preheaters. Four minutes passed, as the temperature of the feedwater entering the core continued to decline. Eventually, the delicate balance gave way to complete instability. At 5.36pm, the operators watched in shock as reactor power rapidly oscillated up and down, from 25% to 50% power every 3 seconds. But even this was not the true value. The startup transient recorder, normally used for recording reactor parameters when testing the reactor during startup, had automatically come online when the recirculation pumps first tripped. Showing the reactor was in fact oscillating between 20 and as high as 95% of rated reactor power every 3 seconds. The operators didn't have access to that information. The low temperature and low flow rates had come together to form waves of power that would form and travel up through the core. The water in the reactor cooled and this caused a dramatic increase in reactivity, heating the water back up, flashing it back into steam, and causing reactivity to drop again. And this was cycling. These waves of power were being further enhanced by the axial power density. In other words, the height at which power in the core was being distributed, being at its strongest near the bottom of the core control rods would have been able to absorb the excess neutrons and prevent the oscillation, but as you may remember, they're almost entirely extracted. You would expect that the operators would shut down the reactor at this point, but the operating regulations in place did not call for this. Instead, they tried to start up one of the recirculation pumps. 
The hope was that they could raise the power back out of the region of instability, and get everything back under control. That way, there would be no reactor downtime. Unfortunately for the operators, they could not get the control valve for the recirculation pumps into its minimum position, meaning the recirculation pump would not start. Abandoning these attempts, the reactor power still oscillating significantly. The shift supervisor ordered that the operators began to make preparations for a reactor scram. But the reactor instead had other ideas, and decided to go out with a bang. As the core destabilization continued, at around 5.39.23, the reactor oscillated up far beyond what anyone had anticipated. 118% reactor power. At this point, the detectors in the core registered a neutron flux of 312% the core average, far exceeding the reactor's design. This triggered an automatic reactor scram, before the operators could perform it manually, sending all the control rods into the core. The reactor was finally brought under control, and straight down to 0% power. The accident was over. The danger was gone. Surprisingly, there was no core damage during the entire event. The operators had had their lucky escape. The investigation concluded that, aside from the initial actions leading to the recirculation pumps tripping, operator error did not play a factor in this accident. Instead, the issue was with the operating instructions they had been trained by. The technical specifications in place at LaSalle at the time were vague. And while the 1984 brief by General Electric, the company that designed the boiling water reactor involved in the accident, had specified that control rods should have been inserted when the recirculation pumps tripped to get themselves out of the region of instability, this had never actually been incorporated into any operating guidelines at the time. Compounding this further is the fact that the accident could not be recreated on boiling water reactor simulators at the time. Calculations at the time had indicated that a decay ratio, the ratio between the size of successive power oscillations in a boiling water reactor at LaSalle Unit 2 was 0.6, and there wasn't a risk of dangerous oscillations until it reached a value of 1, meaning the operators were never educated nor directed nor even could experience such an event, and had no idea on what actions to take. Obviously these guidelines were tightened after the accident, and the calculations used were called into question by the designers. Now, at the start of this video, I said that this almost became a catastrophe. From what we've seen so far, this is nowhere close to it. But, let me pose a question to you. What if the automatic scram had failed? And what if the operators had continued and failed to attempt to restart that recirculation pump? In 1990, scientists with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided to investigate this, curious to see if the reactor would eventually self-stabilise. Their modelling showed otherwise. In a simulation where the automatic scram failed, for whatever hypothetical reason, the oscillations would only continue to reach greater peaks. Power was limited purely by the void coefficient and the fuel temperature coefficient, both of which were negative, allowing the reactor to spike to 1300% of reactor power during the oscillations. Let me quote HBO Chernobyl's Valeriy Legasov here. <clears throat> LaSalle Reactor 2, designed to operate at 3100 megawatts, went beyond 40,000. In the simulation, of course. Prompt criticality in the core was reached for a tenth of a second on each increase in power during an oscillation. 
and the fuel temperature peaked at more than 1800 degrees Celsius. In summary, it's quite easy to say that there's a lot of energy being produced by that reactor. And then the question becomes, what would happen to the core? Accidents like this are no longer possible in general electric boiling water reactors. 